Francis Ngannou absolutely embarrassed Tyson Fury in there last night. A guy on his professional boxing debut going in against the world heavyweight champion and not only being competitive throughout, but actually dropping him and taking him to a split decision. Absolutely shocking stuff. And I'll go further than that. He also embarrassed Derek Chisora. He embarrassed Dylan White. And some would say he even embarrassed Deontay Wilder because he did better against the Gypsy King than all of those guys. And he also embarrassed boxing fans, certainly me, for believing and saying that he had absolutely no chance against Fury whatsoever. With that being said, as you guys know, I've long been arguing that Tyson Fury is not invincible at all and that he's actually ready for the taking. I did a video a few weeks ago saying that both him and Usyk are ready for the taking. Some people agreed with me, other people disagreed. But I've never bought this notion that Tyson Fury is invincible. How could you say that a guy who's been dropped five times prior to the Ngannou fight is invincible? That makes no logical sense whatsoever. I fully expected that if Tyson Fury became undisputed and started defending all those belts, let's say he had 10 fights, within that 10 fights, he would get beaten by somebody. I've always felt that. And the same with Usyk. If he went and beat Tyson Fury, as I said in that previous video, somebody would get Alexander Usyk. So I've been saying that for a while, but I did not think that Francis Ngannou would be the guy and not that he got the official decision over Tyson Fury, but yeah, I didn't think he'd come anywhere close to beating the Gypsy King. I thought this would be like the Tom Schwartz fight where Tyson Fury does whatever he wants with Francis Ngannou. That obviously didn't happen. Let's talk about what did. So the first thing I noticed was Tyson Fury coming out, trying to land a big punch on Ngannou's chin in the early rounds. I think one of the things that maybe disturbed Fury a bit about Francis Ngannou wasn't just the fact that he's got long arms so he could reach him with his own jab, but it was the fact that Ngannou wasn't falling for Tyson Fury's feints. Did you guys notice that? Tyson Fury is one of these fighters that feints a lot. He'll often do double and triple feints and then throw a jab after it, etc. And he wants you to go for his feints. Because once you're going for his feints, he knows he's got you. He can control your reactions once you're going for his feints. But he started feinting at Francis Ngannou early in the fight, and Ngannou wasn't reacting. And so Fury thought, okay, since he's not reacting to my feints, maybe he's just got really slow reflexes. Maybe I can just start letting the shots fly. But when he did let the shots fly, he got countered. So evidently, Francis Ngannou was very good at telling the difference between a feint right? At the time Tyson Fury started to throw it and an actual real punch coming. He could tell the difference. He could read Fury's feints. And as I say, I think that made Fury feel uncomfortable that the guy was reading his feints like that. In the third round, I believe it was, Tyson Fury, again, going for Ngannou with a big right hand, gets caught with a counter left hook and goes down. Now, Tyson Fury's been down, again, five times prior to that. So he's no stranger to the canvas. He's not the most difficult guy in the world to knock down. He has good powers of recovery. We know that. But him going down wasn't really the shocking thing. Because again, you're going in there against the guy who's never boxed, never had a professional boxing match before. You might be complacent. You might take risks that you wouldn't take against more seasoned fighters, more seasoned boxers. So him getting dropped, a moment of madness where he's let his guard down or whatever, that to me, in my mind, wasn't completely out of the question. But I always felt that Fury has been in there against massive punches. And so even if Ngannou hits lightning in a bottle and manages to drop the Gypsy King, Tyson Fury will just get off the canvas and beat him anyway. But what we saw is Ngannou actually showing some counter-punching ability, particularly with the left hook in this fight, which made Tyson Fury more hesitant than certainly I expected. Ngannou also has very long arms, and although his boxing stance looks very amateurish and awkward, his counterpunching, as I say, with a left hook was sharp, and he was able to touch Tyson Fury with his jab because of those long arms. And on the inside, he was able to impose his physical strength on Tyson Fury. I mean, we all know that Francis Ngannou is freakishly strong. This guy's, what is he, 272 pounds of solid muscle. I mean, God knows what this guy lifts. On top of all that, Francis Ngannou showed very good stamina. The fight wasn't for a, a tremendous pace, but a guy as big as Ngannou with that kind of musculature, normally they gas out. He did get tired as the fight wore on, but he actually had his best round other than the knockdown round in round eight. So that was also an eyebrow raiser for me. Now, there are many 
questions about Tyson Fury here. Did he underperform? I mean, there are some people out there saying that Tyson Fury deliberately underperformed because maybe he wants to lull Usyk into a full sense of security, or maybe the Saudis had had a word with him and said, you know what, you really need to sell this fight so that we can give the crowd value for money and so on and so forth. I'm not discounting the possibility that Tyson Fury deliberately underperformed, but I tend to suspect that Ngannou was just better than he thought and better than we all thought, at least us boxing fans, right? I'm sure there were some UFC and MMA fans out there who were saying Ngannou was going to do well, but he certainly did better than I thought. He did better than Fury thought. And if you're going in there expecting to be able to do whatever you want with a guy, sometimes it is hard to raise your motivation. Tyson Fury has long been one of these kind of fighters who tends to fight down to the level of his opposition. So the more danger Tyson Fury perceives himself to be in, normally the better he's going to perform. So did that play into the performance against Ngannou? Maybe. Also, there's something which I've long been concerned about with Tyson Fury, and that is him ballooning up and down in weight. He's been doing it his whole career, obviously, but this normally catches up with fighters in the end, usually sooner rather than later. Tyson Fury has gone many, many years ballooning up in weight, yo-yoing up and down in weight. And it hasn't really caught up with him yet because he is very talented. Was this the fight where it did catch up with him? Because just a few weeks ago, he was enormous. I mean, he was still very heavy against Ngannou. I think he was a career heaviest, but he weighed in with a full tracksuit on and his shoes and all that kind of stuff. I think even a hat, but still he was very heavy in there. But as I say, a few weeks ago, he was massive. And when you constantly abuse your body like that, yo-yoing up and down in weight, it makes it more difficult to produce consistent form in the ring. Your form starts going up and down. You get erratic with your performances. That's why I like to see fighters who are in shape 365. But again, sometimes when you're really talented like Tyson Fury, you get carried away with your talent, thinking that you don't need to train for this guy or that guy or the other guy. Similar to Tyson Fury's namesake, the guy where he got his name from, Mike Tyson. He got a bit like that. I mean, he wasn't as bad as Tyson Fury with it, but he got a bit like that. He was so talented that he didn't train consistently hard for every fight because he was going in there during his first reign as champion. And by his own admission, he was beating guys even without training to the absolute max. I remember when Mike Tyson came out of prison, all of the boxing publications, Ring Magazine, KO Magazine, etc., did Mike Tyson specials, like a whole edition of their magazine that was basically dedicated to Mike Tyson, or at least half of the magazine was all Mike Tyson. And I remember one of them in particular, where they interviewed Mike Tyson and asked him about every single one of his opponents. <laughs> From his pro debut, I think it was Trent Singleton, was that his pro debut? Or was it Sterling Benjamin? I forget which. But they asked him about every single opponent from his pro debut up until his last fight before he got incarcerated, which was the rematch with Razor Ruddock. And for several of his fights that he had, when he was still with Kevin Rooney, he spoke about not really training properly. When he was still with Rooney, he basically said it had become so easy in the ring and he was so talented and he was bashing up sparring partners and all this kind of stuff. And obviously everybody's gassing his head up, telling him he's amazing and all this kind of thing. That it became difficult to find a motivation to train just as hard for every opponent. So maybe Tyson Fury has a little bit of that going on as well. Maybe. Again, I don't want to take anything away from Francis Ngannou because he embarrassed us boxing fans. He embarrassed Tyson Fury. He embarrassed the heavyweight division. In fact, one of the things I forgot to mention in the fight was Ngannou was able to take Fury's power. Now, I've never bought this idea that Fury's this monster puncher. I know Sugar Hill's been saying that Fury's the biggest puncher in the division and Fury's been saying it. Yeah, I don't buy that for a second. But he's got respectable power, but nothing he hit Francis Ngannou with seemed to bother Ngannou whatsoever. So based on that, you'd have to say Ngannou has got a better chin than Dylan White. I mean, that's not really an extraordinary thing because Dylan White's chin at this point is terrible. But you know, Ngannou has been hit with little four ounce MMA gloves on and he was able to take those shots and he was able to take them from proper a proper boxer in Tyson Fury in 10 ounce gloves. I thought Tyson Fury's reflexes looked poor in this fight. Been out the ring a long time, but Ngannou's been out the ring a long time. But again, going back to what I said earlier on, Ngannou is a pure athlete. He's not a guy that's ballooning up in weight, putting 
20, 30 pounds of fat on, he obviously stays in the gym. Whereas Tyson Fury's constantly ballooning up and down. I know a lot of it is to do with genetics. He definitely puts fat on a lot easier than most people. But that's why it's even more important to watch what you're eating and watch what you're doing when you have that type of metabolism. You know, Tyson Fury is 35 years of age. He's been in some tough fights. He's taken some punishment. He balloons up and down in weight. That can affect not only your reflexes, but also your punch resistance. Now, I don't want to say that Tyson Fury's punch resistance is gone. He did get dropped by Ngannou. It was a good left hook. Didn't appear to be particularly hurt by it. I think it was slightly a balanced thing as well as being a good shot. And Fury, of course, has been dropped by cruiserweights in the past, by Steve Cunningham and Nevin Pikage, who was really a very small heavyweight and not a puncher at all. I mean, go and look how many knockouts are on Nevin Pikage's record. Very few. So I can't say that Fury's punch resistance is going because his punch resist, you know, he's got good powers of recovery, but he's never been the most difficult guy to drop. That performance is obviously going to give every other heavyweight out there tremendous confidence against the Gypsy King. I mean, I think they should have already had tremendous confidence against him because to reiterate, I've been saying for the longest time that Fury is not invincible and that there are heavyweights out there who could beat him. And I'm not just talking about Alexander Usyk. I've been saying this for ages. And this performance right here will convince those, at least many of those who didn't believe that, who didn't share my view. Many of them now will share my view. If Usyk had been in the ring with Tyson Fury last night, Usyk would have won a unanimous decision. I know styles make fights and Usyk is very different to Francis Ngannou. Doesn't have that kind of strength, doesn't have that kind of power. But I tell you what, when Francis Ngannou turned southpaw, as he often did in this fight, Tyson Fury's punch output came way down. And it was similar in the first round against Dylan White. The closest round, the only close round really, in that Dylan White, White fight was the first round where White turned southpaw. Now Francis Ngannou, for all his strength and size and arm length and all that kind of stuff, he doesn't have anything close to the type of speed, footwork, head movement, balance, coordination, punch variety, ring IQ, etc., etc. that Alexander Usyk has. I've been saying for the longest, if Tyson Fury is going to beat Alexander Usyk, he's not going to outbox him. I find it extraordinary. I've always found it extraordinary that people think that Fury can outbox Usyk. That's not going to happen. Not unless Usyk is ultra cautious and scared of being hit in the body because of what happened against Daniel Dubois. But if he's the normal Usyk, like the one we saw against Anthony Joshua. Fury's not outboxing that guy. The gap in coordination, balance, and footwork between Usyk and Fury is bigger than you think. And as I say, if that had been Usyk in there against Tyson, he would have won a unanimous decision. And I wouldn't completely count out the possibility of Usyk dropping Tyson Fury. Maybe not with one shot, but if you put several shots together, it could happen. Now, if the Usyk Fury fight goes ahead, and I certainly hope it does, I would expect Tyson Fury to be a lot better because he's going to go back to the drawing board after that performance against Ngannou. That's giving him a wake-up call. He's going to know that that's nowhere near good enough. He'll need to be several levels better than that to have any realistic chance of beating Usyk. Again, Usyk's a guy who stays in shape year-round. Yeah, he's a little bit older than Fury, but he's kept his body well-preserved. If Martin Bacoli, and I'll talk about Bacoli separately, but if Martin Bacoli in shape, not 300 pounds, let's say Martin Bacoli at 265, 270. If he'd been in there against Tyson Fury, he would have beaten him. Probably would have stopped him. There are several heavyweights. I'm telling you, if they'd been in there against Fury, they would have beaten him on that kind of form. So Fury is going to need to raise up his game significantly for the Usyk fight. And I had to laugh because Fury and Frank Warren just did an AJ and Eddie Hearn. You know, in the run-up to the Hellenius fight, AJ and Eddie Hearn, particularly Hearn, were talking about fighting Deontay Wilder. And then after the fight, when AJ struggled with Hellenius, he was asked if Wilder is next, and all of a sudden he started getting evasive. Tyson Fury and Frank Warren did the same thing in the ring when they were asked about if he's still up for fighting Usyk on December 23rd. Oh, 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 well, well, you know, got to have a good long rest and this and that, and he always got a cut and... <laughs> <laughs> they were literally doing an AJ and Eddie Hearn. Fury is a smart boxing man and he knows that was nowhere near good enough. I say smart boxing man, he obviously underestimated Francis Ngannou, but in terms of understanding where he is after that performance, he knows. And as for Ngannou, there are lots of people out there saying on that form he beats Anthony Joshua. They're saying it's 50-50 with Wilder. I'm happy for Francis Ngannou because for so many years, he was being underpaid and underappreciated in the UFC. He's crossed over to boxing. He's put on a performance 
performance against Tyson Fury that has surprised the vast majority of people, certainly me. And that obviously opens doors to more big fights for Francis Ngannou in a boxing ring. Eddie Hearn has already said that he'd put Anthony Joshua in there with Francis Ngannou now because Ngannou's proved himself against Fury. So that now makes him a viable contender. Ngannou may well now get a ranking. We wanted to sanction in bodies after that performance. Would I pick him now that I saw him perform against Fury against, let's say AJ or anybody else in the top 10? Maybe I'm hard headed, but I'm going to say no. I wouldn't put, pick him against AJ. And you guys know, I think AJ is mentally shot to pieces. But Ngannou, as strong as he is and as surprising as that counterpunching was, and his chin seems pretty good, right? He's tremendously slow. Slow feet, slow hands. I mean, his left hook was quite quick, but other than that, he's slow. Very little head movement. His guard looks quite open. I mean, he was able to get away from what Tyson Fury was throwing at him a lot of the time. But Tyson Fury is just one style. There are many other styles out there in the heavyweight division. There are guys who will be able to hit Francis Ngannou with more serious shots than that on a consistent basis. I mean, imagine Andy Ruiz against Francis Ngannou. Ruiz is going to be touching that chin. Best believe there are going to be guys who are quicker than Tyson Fury. I mean, Frank Sanchez, he was actually at the fight, at the event. And, and by the way, before I go further, the production on this show was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was extraordinary. But you know how the Saudis do? Spare no expense. They literally had basically a music concert before the main event. I think that that was the opening ceremony for Riyadh season. I don't think that whole concert thing was just for the Fury and Ganu fight. Maybe I'm wrong, but my impression was it was the opening ceremony for the Riyadh season. But yeah, an extraordinary production. Never seen anything like that before in my life. You know, with the move, the stage that was moving all over the place. And then at the end, the ring came out of the ground. And <laughs> it was crazy. But anyway, yeah, and Ganu. As much as he surprised me, I would still pick the likes of AJ over him. I'd pick Andy Ruiz over him. I'd pick Deontay Wilder over him. I'd pick most, if not all, fighters in the top 10 over Ngannou because they're going to understand that they have to take him seriously now. If I was going to pick Ngannou over anyone who's in or around the top 10, it might be people like Ajit Kabayel, for example. I'd give Ngannou a shot against him. How about Ngannou against F.A. Jagba? That'd be an interesting fight. The two West African big punchers. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up here. I'll do several more videos about this fight, the aftermath and so on. But I'll just leave you with my score. <laughs> and this is going to be controversial in itself. I had Tyson Fury winning by two rounds. There's a narrative out there that Francis Ngannou got robbed and he clearly won the fight. Mayweather said that Francis Ngannou won the fight. Loads of people are saying Ngannou won. If you had Ngannou winning, I'm not saying that that's absurd, but personally, I had Fury winning by two rounds. I thought Ngannou was a little too inactive through the middle portion of the fight and he allowed Fury to nick rounds just using his jab moving around. There wasn't a lot happening, but I feel as though Fury did just enough in those middle rounds to hustle Ngannou out of it. Anyway, let me know what you guys thought about this surprising fight in the comments section below. Are you sick and tired of the mainstream mindset? Does the dogmatic conformity and pathological ignorance have you tearing your hair out in frustration? Then don't be alone. Come and join our brotherhood on Patreon. We stand as a beacon of reason against an army of insanity. You'll gain access to my weekly topical podcast where we take more deep dives than Jacques Cousteau on an endless variety of subjects. There's also videos, interviews, live Q&As, as well as a vast back catalog of previous episodes, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen via the Patreon app, or download in high quality mp3. Connect with myself and hundreds of other members in our Element chat group. There's no contract, no commitment, you can cancel at any time, and it's cheaper than a Mickey D's McMuffin. Just head to my Patreon page via the link below this video and select the tier called the Brotherhood of Reason. I'll see you over there.